It is a joy to be with you this morning. It is a joy to have the opportunity to lead you in worship, even if from afar. Um, I won't leave this hanging here forever, but it is part of my announcements. Just your friendly neighborhood reminder to wear your mask whenever you're in public and around other people that are not members of your own household, um, particularly if you're going to be within six feet. It's a uh, it's also time for another friendly reminder that when you wear your mask, you wanna wear it covering both your nose and your mouth. Um, I was at Wegmans the other day and I saw, I saw a lot of this. Um, fun fact, respiratory droplets come out your nose too. So if you're trying to hide respiratory droplets, the way to do it is like this, okay? Should be basic, but you know. People forget. And so this is your friendly neighborhood reminder because we as people of faith uh, have an embodied faith. And so we care about each other's bodies as well as each other's souls. Also in the way of announcements, we are continuing obviously to worship remotely via Zoom. Um, I've said for the last several weeks that the reopening task force has been working on figuring out how and when to most safely reopen the building for in-person worship. They've completed a proposal which will go next to the leadership team in a couple of weeks. And hopefully once that, that team has had their chance to, um, to act on the proposal, then I'll have some more concrete information to share with you all. Until further notice, we'll just keep on keeping on as we are. One of the benefits of Zoom too is that we can, uh, we can worship together as a community across even town and state and country boundaries. Anyone anywhere in the world can join us at any time. Um, and it's good to know that we have some friends visiting us from different parts of the state and from different states as well this morning. We are continuing to reach out in connection with one another and the Connect team is now looking at an idea that came from one within the congregation of a sort of pen pal system, a pop-up postcard system. And so we're working on getting that together so that we can reach out to each other in Christ's love, even if from a distance. So be on the lookout for more information about that. We are continuing to learn together as a handful of us are engaged in a study called Imagine No Racism. I'm looking at study options for the fall as well. Um, and any study that we do, we will, we will have the option um, to do it remotely, even if we are uh, planning otherwise, we'll, we'll also have a remote option. So those who don't feel comfortable meeting in person um, can still take part in the study. As far as our serve team goes, I would celebrate again. I know we said this last week, but I would celebrate again over $1,000 in contributions to Family Promise uh, for the virtual bed race fundraiser. That's really extraordinary work. And it does, um, it does the very things that Jesus taught us to do, to, to care for those most in need in our communities. And so I thank you for your commitment to that ministry, as well as to supporting the other ministries that the church uplifts. I'm not thinking of any other announcements to lift up at this time, and I'm not seeing anyone frantically chat me about things that I forgot. Speaking of the chat, I would just remind you that the chat feature is available on Zoom for you to use for prayer requests, which I can lift up later on in the service during our joys and concerns. Okay. With no other announcements then, I would invite us to take a deep breath in, a deep breath out, and center our hearts in Christ's love. Thank you. 
but how can we put into practice the rule of doing good? What difference can our actions make in our lives and in the lives of others? Today, as we enter into week four of the Three Simple Rules worship series, we'll consider these questions about putting rule number two, the rule to do good, into practice. And so let's dive into worship together this day as we worship God and study God's word. Our opening hymn is my mom's favorite, and I like to throw it in every now and then just because I love my mom. It's called Morning Has Broken, and it's number 145 in the hymnal. Forgot to warn you all ahead of time. Charity and I will be masked when we sing today, as we just were. We we realized that while the organ and the pulpit are six feet apart, the recommendation for singing is twelve feet. And so, in order to make sure that we set a good example and keep each other safe, we're gonna we're gonna try masking while singing today on one of the hottest days of the year. This will be an adventure. Let us pray. Everlasting God, as we put into practice this rule of doing good, show us the way past our doubts and fears, and give us confidence and resolve to make a difference. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. For special music today, we have a guest singer-songwriter. Her name is Hannah Goldberg, and she is zooming in with us from Romulus today and she'll be performing one of her original compositions. So I will pass it over to Hannah to tell you a little more about her piece, Stars. Hi everyone. Um, so this is a song that I wrote a couple years back for a friend of mine who um, was going through a neck injury and it took her out of school. So she was laid up at home and it was a very difficult time for her and her family. So I wrote this song in hopes to spread positivity and uh, keep you know, the light in everyone's life, really. I just wanted to bring people together and, um, you know, bring happiness through a tough time. So um, I'm gonna play a little bit of that song for you today. Actually, I'll play the whole thing. Um, and it's called Stars. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> The 
clock is ticking, but time stands still. My mind is spinning and it doesn't seem real. Cold days turn to dark nights. You were there for me when things weren't right. Oh, I can't count the number of stars that spark up the sky, the light that shines down from the moon through the night doesn't even compare to the light in my life when you're around. The beautiful trees that sway in the breeze, hot summer days but they're swaying fear. Blue ocean waves crash up on the beach, it's the feeling when you're around. Oh, oh, oh. You're a diamond in the rock Appears beautiful but inside your tub Nothing can break you, just stay strong and keep moving on oh, I can't count the number of stars that spark up the sky, the light that shines down from the moon through the night doesn't even compare to the light in my life when you're around. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And in the Zoom link that went out this week, there was a link to learn more about Hannah and uh, see some more of her music and um, download that song if you liked it. So thank you, Hannah. Thank you. What a blessing to have Hannah with us this morning. We'll move now into our children's time. And so I would invite God's children of all ages to tune their ears in again. Um, we, we finished a series last week with the kids. We, we talked a bit about the Lord's Prayer. And just as a side note, something cool happened in my own household. Um, my Jacob, who is four years old, started praying the Lord's Prayer on his own now. We used to do it kind of as a, a back and forth. I would say, our Father, and he would say, who art in heaven, and we would go back and forth like that. Well, I started that the other night at, at bedtime with him, and he said, no, I will pray the Lord's Prayer. And then he did. So the Lord's Prayer is something that is going to be a part of our faith tradition forever and always. Amen. Another thing that's a part of our faith tradition is our call to be good stewards of our time and our energy. So for kids, what that means is our call is to do good things with what we have to make sure that we're not hurting other people, to make sure that we're helping other people, and to make sure that we're expressing our love for God. So through, through the last month or so, the grown-ups have been studying something called the three simple rules for holy living. And remember from the Lord's Prayer, the word holy means like perfect and wonderful and awesome and set apart. So we're going to start to jump in on what the, the big sermon has been about, and we're going to start to study the three simple rules ourselves. 
more rules does not sound like fun. <laughs> I know that for most kids, you probably did not come to church online or in person hoping for more rules, but these ones, these ones are really good sort of big life rules. They're not rules like you have to put the dishes away after dinner. They're rules more like don't hurt others. Big rules like that. So the three rules that we follow when we call ourselves Christians and live like God wants us to are these. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Today we'll talk just about what it means to do no harm. Harm is not exactly a churchy word, but it's also another one of those words that doesn't really get used every single day. And so just in case you're not clear on what that word means, harm and hurt are almost the same thing. So when we say do no harm, what we really mean is don't hurt other people. And not just their bodies. It doesn't just mean don't hit or don't kick or don't throw things at people. It also means don't hurt people's hearts or don't hurt people's feelings. So things like name calling or saying mean things to others or taking something that belongs to someone without their permission. Those are things that would hurt another person's heart or hurt another person's feelings. So the rule to do no harm is a rule to always be thinking about what we're doing and whether it's going to hurt someone else. Now we can hurt other people on accident or on purpose. And sometimes accidents do just happen. This morning, uh, two of my kids accidentally, one hurt the other. Um, my Sarah was, was sweeping the dining room um, for one of her chores, and, and she accidentally lost control of the broom handle and hit, hit her brother in the head. There was, it, she was not in the wrong for that. She did cause harm, but it was completely and totally an accident. And that's, that's kind of a different thing than what we're talking about. Sometimes accidents happen when we're just plain not being careful, though, or not watching out for other people. If you're playing with your sibling, for instance, and you're not watching where you're running and you run into them and knock them over, that's, that's kind of an accident that probably could have been stopped before it happened. So part of doing no harm is to just be careful to just be aware of ourselves and others around us so that we don't accidentally hurt someone else if we can avoid it. But sometimes we accidentally hurt people on purpose too, don't we? I think that most of the time when we hurt someone else on purpose, it's because our feelings got too big. I know that I hurt people on purpose sometimes if I get angry and my anger gets too big and I say something I shouldn't have said that hurts someone's feelings. Or if I get really, really, really scared, I might do something to hurt someone else on purpose because my feeling of being scared got so big and I just wanted to protect myself. Have you ever had a time when your feelings got so big that, that they kind of got you out of control and you hurt someone else because of it? I know that happens to me sometimes. And so one way that we have to make sure that we don't hurt other people, that we do no harm, as the rule says, is by learning what to do with those extra big feelings that get us in trouble sometimes. So when you have an extra big feeling like, like anger or fear or even sadness, one of the things that you can do with that feeling to make sure you don't hurt another person is to take some deep breaths. I'm sure you've heard that before from the grown-ups in your household or, or at school. Taking deep breaths that really go all the way deep down in can help to calm us down and help us to make better choices. Another way might be to move your body in a way that helps you get your feelings out. I know that one of my kids, I won't say which one, but one of my kids sometimes gets feelings too big and they don't know what to do with them. And so they do jumping jacks. And just doing jumping jacks, moving their body in that way, helps them to get their feelings out in a way that doesn't hurt anyone else. Some people like to dance to get their feelings out, or to sing, or to do art like with crayons or with Play-Doh. 
Or if your grown-up lets you, you can listen to music that helps you get your feelings out too. My kids have certain songs that help them feel better when their feelings get really, really big. They have to ask their dad and I for permission because they're not allowed to touch our devices that play the music. But, but usually we, we will say yes when they say that they need a certain song to help them get their big feelings under control. So the next two weeks, we're going to learn about some of the other rules, the, the how to do good and how to stay in love with God. But, but this week, let's just start with doing no harm, with trying our best to not hurt other people. So our challenge for this week is two things. One, be more aware of ourselves so that we don't accidentally hurt someone. And two, use some calming strategies when our feelings get so big so that we don't hurt someone on purpose out of our anger or fear or sadness. That's our challenge for this week. And as we do all of that, and as we practice all of that, we're going to remember God's love for us as we sing, Jesus Loves Me. Would you pray with me? Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from a letter. It's the second letter to the Thessalonians. So we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition they received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example. For everyone, for, for even when we are with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busy bodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. For those of you who might be tuning in for the first time, um, I'll just kind of offer a recap of where we're at. We're in the middle of a six-week sermon series. This is week four, and the series is on the three simple rules for holy living. These are, these are guidelines or rules or sort of a framework that came from the teachings of John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement, which was like the predecessor, one of the predecessors for the United Methodist Church. The first rule, as we just studied with the children, is to do no harm. The second rule that we will spend two weeks, last week and today on, is to do good. And then beginning next week, we'll study the third rule, to stay in love with God. So last week when we started to study the rule to do good, we, we delved into the biblical and the Wesleyan foundations of our call to do good. Today, we, we go a little bit deeper still and get a little bit more practically oriented 
with a call to conviction and to persistence. A call to conviction and to persistence. Many of you have heard me say this. I say it probably three or four times a year. I had a professor in seminary, one of my preaching professors, um, a Catholic nun who went by the name Sister Barb, um, who, who taught me probably one of the most important things that I ever learned when I was learning how to preach. She said, class, a preacher's job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. A preacher's job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. Well, starting next week, we'll spend two weeks um, delving into our relationship with God, that, that perfect and whole and holy source of comfort that we have. So, so starting next week, we'll, we'll hear a lot about things that bring comfort to, to hearts that are disturbed. But for now, we have a text here that was meant a couple thousand years ago and works this way still to disturb the comfortable. It's time for us to get stirred up a bit, in other words. Now this section that we read today, starting in verse six, begins with a tone of really solemn significance. The authors of the letter say, now we command you. Now this language um, sounds kind of just bible to us today and doesn't maybe carry the weight that it would have to the original audience of the letter. You know that difference between when a parent says to their child, honey, would you do this for me, please? And I need you to pay attention and do what I'm about to tell you. You know the difference, right? This is the apostle version of the latter. This isn't a friendly, gentle suggestion. This isn't something that they're just kind of putting out there as a good idea. They're saying, we command you. This is of utmost importance, and I need you to listen in. That's, that's really what the apostles are saying with this language. If that weren't enough, they double down on the importance of what they're about to say by saying, now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not just something the apostles are taking on as their own good ideas. This is something that they're invoking Christ's very name to command. We command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This commandment language is echoed again in verse 12 and then further reiterated by using language that reinforces a reference to glorifying Christ. This is not about what the apostles want the, the believers in, in the church in Thessalonica to do. This is about what Christ has commanded through the apostles, and what will glorify Jesus himself. So what are they commanding? What is the commandment? Well, the command itself actually has a couple of layers to it, which are um, relevant still to us today. The first is, is the obvious one. It's a command against laziness, right? Or the word that they use is idleness. We see the word idleness twice and the word idle once and a reference to not working another time. Four times the same idea of speaking out against idleness or laziness is, is reiterated in this short text. It seems that the people in that community were, were kind of indulging a sense of entitlement and were not working for their own food. Now the apostles, the ones writing this letter, had the right by the social hierarchy that they were in to, to feed off of the work of others, to not work for their own food. But even so, the apostles chose to work for their own food to set an example for the believers to imitate. It was so important to the apostles that the believers pick up on this rule that even though they didn't need to for their own purposes, the apostles set an example by, by working day and night, they said, by toiling day and night. In a sense, this command is a simple one. It's a command against laziness and entitlement. There's a danger inherent in this command, though. 
See, one of the one of the things that that a lot of people, at least in in within earshot of me, I would say, have started to talk about is is the laziness of people living off the system, right? This is not a new rhetoric. So so lest we grab hold of this commandment and use it as a way to to deface others or to judge others. Let's take a minute to remember that, that this commandment is not about how others live their lives. It's a call for us to self-examine about how we live our lives. In other words, worry about yourself. Don't worry about what other people are doing, right? And lest we use this commandment to speak ill of others, let us also remember the teachings of the first two weeks of this series to do no harm, to love everyone, even our enemies, and to bear witness to the pain of others without judgment. And so this commandment at its core is really just a commandment against laziness, a commandment against complacency. And complacency, many have said, is one of the greatest dangers that the modern church faces. We don't have quite the same obstacles to work against that some of our predecessor churches did. The church, as established in the first few decades of its life, for instance, was an illegal entity persecuted by the Roman authorities. We have the legal right to worship freely without persecution. Most of us, not all of us I recognize, but most of us don't have to fight tooth and nail just to make sure those in our household have enough to eat each day. If you are someone who does have uh, food insecurity that you're, that you're dealing with, please reach out to the church. We have resources to help. Most of us do not have to fight against the persecution of our peers because our faith is that of the majority in our culture. There are a lot of obstacles that predecessor churches had to fight against, to work against really basic level things that they had to overcome in order to practice their faith that we just don't have to worry about today. And so it's easy in a lot of ways, it's insidiously easy for us to become complacent or idle. This letter commands against idleness. There's a second layer to all of this too though. And it's also one that can be misapplied. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. But, but the second layer that's inherent here is a command against disruptiveness. Now, I know we don't really see that language anywhere in this text. Um, what we're dealing with is a bit of a translation issue. When we look back at a similar reference in the first letter to of the text, we understand that verse seven, when the apostles say, we were not idle, actually better translates as we were not disrupted or we were not disorderly. It seems within the community in the church in Thessalonica that there was some kind of insubordination coupled with a refusal to work. Insubordination coupled with a refusal to work. And that's what the apostles are referencing in this letter. Now again, lest we grab hold of this and make it about the disorderliness of others, let's remember to self-examine ourselves before all else. For many of us have logs in our own eyes that keep us from seeing clearly the specks in others. Regardless, this command is against two different things. One is against idleness, laziness, but the other is against a sort of disruptive busybodiness that doesn't help others or ourselves, but might actually cause harm. So how does this all play out in the here and now? These are sort of, sort of heady, abstract, detached sort of concepts in a way. But how does this letter impact our lives today? Well, first, it calls us to perseverance in our work. It calls us to, to beat back the, the temptation to be idle and ends with a, with a verse that says, Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. 
it calls us to perseverance in doing good. But it also calls us to a lot of self-examination regarding the reasons for our work. Now, those who are engaging in this disruptive, disorderly conduct that the, that the authors seemed to speak against, they, they didn't seem to be thinking of the well-being of the community in what they were doing. It's not that they were being lazy. They were just being busybodies that, that were doing things that were unhelpful at best and maybe even harmful. I'll give an example of how this, this self-examination might help us to reset our paradigm and to reframe our work of doing good. Today is my son's birthday party. His birthday was last Tuesday. Today, uh, when I'm done here, I'll go home and prep some more food. I've got most of it done already and make sure the house and the kids are all clean enough for grandparents. And then people will come over at about 2 o'clock. Um, it'll be a small outdoor gathering, just, just fewer than 20 of us, um, and we'll be all COVID safe, so don't worry about that. But, but I do want to get the house cleaned ahead of time, and I spent the bulk of the day yesterday working on that. It used to be, even as recently as last month when we held my daughter's birthday party, that I would clean my house so that my guests wouldn't judge me for my poor housekeeping. It was all about me. I would clean my house so that I could have this sense of, see how good of a housekeeper I am? Look what I did. Look how clean my, my corners are. There aren't any cobwebs there. It was all about me. Yesterday, there was something that had changed in my spirit. And while I was cleaning my house, I had a different energy behind it, thanks be to God. It wasn't an anxious energy about trying to prove my own, my own value through my housekeeping abilities. It was, it was an energy that held my guests in mind rather than myself. I pictured people I loved spreading out in the backyard laughing and snacking and drinking lemonade. I pictured the two other kids that are going to be at the party playing with my kids, running through the sprinkler with swimsuits on and shrieking and giggling like kids do. I pictured us all piling into the living room with the windows open while my son opened his birthday presents given to him by the people who love him the most. I was thinking about others and I was doing the same work, but with a very different spirit. One of the things that this text convicts us to do is to think of others when we do our work. Not to be mere busybodies, but to do our work so that we can set an example for others, or so that we can ease the burden of others, or so that at our core, we can share God's love with others by doing good. Not for our sake, but for the sake of love. And so whatever we do, whatever good we do, and however we do it, let us remember that we are called to work without wearying and to do good not for the sake of busyness, not in a disruptive sort of way, but simply for the glory of the Lord. And as we heard last week, and as John Wesley is purported to have said, our call as followers of Christ is to do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. And all of this for the glory of the Lord. May it be so. Amen. Our hymn is from the faith we sing. It's called The Summons, and it's number 2130.
As we enter into our prayer together, I'll lift up a few of the concerns that have come my way throughout the week. Um, and I'll invite you to take a moment now, if you haven't already, to send me additional joys or concerns through the chat feature on Zoom. There are a couple in our community that are in need of our prayers for healing. Um, and remember, as always, I'll only offer first names and not many details because of how public this setting is online. But we'll be praying today for healing for Michael and for Gary. We're also asked to pray for comfort for those who are grieving. There's a grieving family within our own congregation that we'll be lifting up in prayer. I'd also ask for prayers for uh, those grieving a uh, parishioner from a previous appointment of mine. I, I learned yesterday morning of the death of a previous parishioner um, from a different appointment in a different, in a different area. And so we'll be praying for, for all of us who are grieving at her death. And for those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. We'll pray for the parents and guardians, teachers, staff, administrators, all who are making back to school choices, uh, particularly in our area in New York State as the governor officially made his yes to reopening schools announcement this past week. Um, there's no perfect choice. There's no easy choice from, from really any, any angle for any household. And so we'll be in prayer for all of those who have difficult choices to make around schools. We'll also be in prayer for those who are in areas that have already opened schools and are wrestling with all of the different aspects, depending on what their communities and their families are doing, the, um, the, the challenges that come with in-person learning, online learning, hybrid learning, homeschooling, all of that. We'll continue to be in prayer for um, for those in Lebanon who are suffering at the hands of just unthinkable violence. We do have a blessing to lift up today, a blessing and thankfulness that Greg uh, got to go back to work on Monday after five months of furlough. So we celebrate that we were, um, I know that, that it was a hard time to be out of work for five full months and we celebrate that Greg is back to work after five months of furlough. Any other joys or concerns that you'd like to chat at me before we pray together? Then let us join our hearts together in prayer. Oh God, we praise you for all that you are. You are holy, you are almighty, you are awesome, oh God. We celebrate you and all that you are. For we know that it is you who put the stars in the sky. We know that it is you who put music in our world. We know that it is you who are our inspiration, our peace, our joy. You, O oh God, are love in its purest form. We confess, O oh God, that we have not always loved you not with our whole hearts, whole minds, whole bodies, whole souls. We have not always loved our neighbors as ourselves. We often fall short in preventing harm or in doing good or in loving you fully. And yet we give you thanks, O oh God. We give you thanks for the forgiveness you have already extended to us. We give you thanks for your mercies, which are new every morning. We give you thanks for we are a people free from the burden of sin. We thank you for the blessings that you've placed in our lives. For work, for fellowship, for love we share among us. We thank you for the ways in which we support one another within this faith community and for the opportunities you've given us to support those in the community around us. All the while, we pray for your blessings, O oh God, for those most in need. 
for those who are ill or injured, in mind, in body, or in spirit, we pray for your healing touch. For those who are grieving, we pray for that peace which passes understanding. For those who are living in fear or facing difficult choices, for those caught up in violence, that perpetrators will come to know your love in a way that brings an end to their violent ways and that victims will find safety and security in the body of Christ. We pray for those living in poverty or in scarcity. And we pray that you would stir in the hearts of those who have more than we need to reach out in love and generosity to those who have not their daily bread. We pray for those who are living under the thumb of oppression. That we might be part of the liberation effort so that all people might find freedom in Christ. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We continue in prayer by living out our prayer, living out our faith by giving generously of that which God has given to us. I would invite you to take a moment now to make your offering to the work of Christ either online or by filling out an envelope to send in to the church.
Let us pray. All things come from you, O God, and with praise and thanksgiving we return to you what is yours. You created all that is and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior, that we might have abundant and eternal life. And now we join our voices across the miles in the prayer Jesus taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is the one we'll use throughout our Three Simple Rules series. It's called, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian, and it's number 402 in the hymnal. today let us live in love holding fast to what is good may we be a blessing to enemies as well as friends as we overcome evil with good and make a difference in the world that god so loves may it be so amen
Okay, have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Emily.